Hello, my name is Jeremy Collins. I'm the director of conferences and symposia here at the National World War II Museum. And we have a great program lined up for you today. Actually, it's the first of two we have for you. Uh, it is gonna be a discussion about a very distinguished career, but also it's going to be a great deep dive into uh, the history and historiography of the Third Reich, the German military, the Holocaust and World War II. Uh, moderating today's conversation is a colleague and friend of mine, Dr. Jason Dossie. He is the research historian here at the museum's Institute for the Study of War and Democracy, where amongst many things, he researches family members' service records to uh, help provide them a better insight into their loved one's service. He writes many of the articles that you see on our website and he also, I think, conducts at least one of these webinars a month uh, with our visiting scholars, authors, professors. He's a native of Columbia, Mississippi, where he received his PhD in 2013 at the University of Chicago, where he studied under today's guest speaker, Dr. Michael Geyer. He has taught at the University of Southern Mississippi and the University of Tennessee at Knoxville and he is currently teaching some of the museum's online master's degree programs that we are in partnership with Arizona State University. So it's my pleasure to turn the program over to Dr. Jason Dawsey. Jason. Jeremy, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome you to today's webinar. Really delighted to be able to have this fascinating exchange about the career and work of Dr. Michael Geyer, one of the foremost authorities on the German military, the Third Reich, and World War II. Dr. Geyer is Samuel N. Harper Professor Emeritus of German and European History and the College at the University of Chicago. He had previously taught at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. He is the co-author or co-editor of, I'm just going to mention a, a small number of works, Resistance Against the Third Reich, 1933 to 1990, which appeared in 1994. Shattered Past, Reconstructing German Histories of 2003. Beyond Totalitarianism, Stalinism and Nazism Compared from 2009. And volume three of the Cambridge History of the Second World War, titled Total War, Economy, Society and Culture from 2015. He's also published numerous articles and book chapters on World War I, the Wehrmacht, and the Nazi regime. Michael, it is great to have you today. We really appreciate you joining us. Always good to see you. We get the strong contrast between Chicago weather and New Orleans weather, uh, between Hyde Park and us right here kind of close to the Mississippi River. It's uh, terrific to see you. And before we kind of get into our questions, I would like our our viewers out there to be aware of the fact that we're going to discuss your career today, but there are going to be certain topics you've written about extensively. We're going to, we're not just going to be able to deal with. You've obviously published on world history, on transnationalism, on multiculturalism, and, and obviously a great deal of work on the history of human rights. So for our viewers out there, this is actually just showing one area of Dr. Geyer's work dealing with the German military, the Third Reich, and World War II. So with that, Michael, I'd like to just jump right in and talk about your research path, like how you've made your way to these topics. When you started work in, in then West Germany at the Albert Ludwig University of Freiburg, how did you become interested in the topic of the German military and the Nazi regime at a time when the myth of the clean Wehrmacht was still very prevalent. And then a follow up with that is that you came, you know, you went into graduate school following a, a lot of upheaval in West Germany as everywhere else in the 1960s. And so I wanted to ask about if the new left and the student upheavals of that decade influenced your perspective as a young scholar. Well, thank you, uh, Jason, and thank you everyone for attending this very honor uh, to jump right in into uh, to your question to answer your question. You know, I'd like to tell you a, a heroic story of resistance and uh, against uh, the, 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 the myth of the clean Wehrmacht. 
But the fact of the matter is that my family uh, has always been a family of conscripts, myself included. No one ever rose beyond uh, the level of the private. I was in the, doing my military service. I was trained as a machine gunner and turned into a medic. So we did not believe the generals. That's, I think, the bottom line. The second aspect probably is that um, the Cold War was for us not a distant war, but uh, very much a presence, a presence in light of the war just having been fought. Uh, and in terms of the actual uh, presence of military forces. Uh, there was an entire French regiment behind my high school. So, you know, the, the military was not very far away. It was very present. Still, none of this actually led me to study, uh, to want to study military history. Uh, in fact, it took me until Oxford till 1977 uh, that I discovered that one could actually with good, with good conscience study military history. But what turned me from a medieval historian who wanted to study the Carmelites an eremitic order in, of the 13th, uh, 12th and 13th century uh, uh, turned into a mendicant order. What turned me was a seminar which was on, uh, radi which I remember as being about radical nationalism and war, particularly German radical nationalism uh, and war, and the colonial war in Southwest Africa. Now, uh, those are topics, of course, that are prominent, uh, which are prominent into the present. But interestingly enough, uh, the uh, professor who taught uh, that uh, course, that seminar, you wouldn't recognize it was Andreas Hillgruber, uh, who, as is well known, uh, was always a conservative, to be sure, was always a defender of, the, uh, of, of a kind of real, realpolitik uh, uh, type of history. But clearly, uh, from the late 60s and early 70s to the late 70s and 80s, uh, drifted towards the right and became then subject of a, a, a quite considerable scandal, which in, in Germany, which is known as the Historiker Streit. Uh, so um, I started out with a very critical history and a very critical understanding uh, of uh, the German military tradition and particularly the role of nationalism on the one hand and colonialism and imperialism on the other hand, uh, which was basically provided <laughs> by a person who, whom you would never expect to have, uh, have done that. Well, that, that's really fascinating, Michael, because I, I know as someone who, who studied with you that you, at that time when I was in graduate school assigned Helmut Bly, whose own book on German Southwest Africa, German colonialism in Africa was still quite recent, had recently appeared when you're talking about you beginning your studies. And obviously we have the work of Isabel Hull and so many others since then. So it's interesting the, the path that you, that you forge toward this subject matter. I think a lot of our viewers may not be familiar with Andreas Hillgruber, but Michael, he was your, your Dr. Fata, your, your advisor, and you dedicated an article to him in the, the mid-1980s on German strategy in the age of machine warfare. Is there anything else about, about Hillgruber and his legacy that you would you think that our viewers should be aware of beyond his role as a conservative voice in this debate about the Nazi past? Yes. Uh, well, there are positive and negative things to remember. Uh, 
he was, for me, he was extremely influential uh, in three ways. First of all, uh, he did point me to uh, the reality of colonial war. Genocide was not a term back then yet in common use, so we didn't use it, but uh, the, the very harsh and stark realities of an annihilationist war was always a reality for me. I didn't have to discover it. It was right there from the start of my studies. The second point, uh, also a new discovery for some, uh, is the very presence of the United States as global power changing the international game radically and dramatically. So the United States as an actor and as an enemy uh, as uh, in an emerging global politics uh, and the Nazi, uh, Nazi war in that context was always a reality for me. But I think the deepest impact uh, was uh, a, a, an essay he wrote very early on uh, in uh, my career as a student and which I found deeply troubling and deeply moving is his linking of Barbarossa, uh, the aggression against the Soviet Union and the Judeo side. For him, this were two sides of one uh, of one disastrous annihilist, annihilationist war, which then became uh, Weltanschauungskrieg in the uh, Militärgeschichtliche Forschungsamt in the 10 volumes of the Second World War. So that was an influential concept uh, that, uh, that, uh, uh, that ricocheted through the entire profession it is now superseded by much more sophisticated work, often critical work. The other side of it, is that he raised an issue uh, which actually led to the scandal uh, uh, and, and that is the empathy for German soldiers uh, fighting uh, in the war and fighting especially not just uh, especially in the last years of the war. And the question, this is in the context of Reagan's visit to Bitburg, right? The question was, uh, what about this empathy? Where should we put the German dead, the war dead, uh, including the criminal war dead uh, in this context? Where should we put all this? Should we have empathy with the German soldiers as Hillgruber argued, because in 1944-45, they fought desperately to hold off Bolshevism, the advance of Russia, of, of, of uh, uh, Stalinism into Central Europe. Should we believe this argument? And what's wrong with it? Well, what is wrong with it? First of all, if you make this argument of German soldiers desperately fighting to hold off uh, the, uh, the Red Army, you have to acknowledge that every day continuing this fight also meant continuing mass murder. This was the beginning of the death marches. This was the moment of utter destruction. So the implication of one in the other is always present. Add to this uh, on a very private level, I probably would have, a, uh, I would have a sister if the soldiers had not fought because uh, my stepsister actually, uh, 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 came to death in the uh, bombing attack on Freiburg in late November 1944. So it also continued the suffering of the German population. Uh, so 
the empathy of uh, German soldiers fighting, holding off communism, first of all, is a problem in, in its own right, but it becomes loaded and it becomes really deeply troubling in the context of what it entails. Fighting entails continuing the war and moreover, and this has become a theme of uh, I've been writing about continuing the war into self-destruction because there was no absolutely no chance of any kind of uh, uh, of any kind of victory any longer. This was absolutely gratuitous fighting. So this is um, this this is this was one of the problems. Uh, of 1985-86 when the his, uh, historical stride beckoned, uh, though the main issue was really bringing together this uh, the uh, zweierlei Untergang as the German title of uh, the little essay of that little essay volume uh, uh, was called the meaning comparing the annihilation of uh, of uh, and the murder of uh, the Jews in Europe with the destruction or the self destruction of the German uh, the German imperial state. That's really interesting, Michael, because I I know that you have these questions about self destruction, about kind of fighting these catastrophic wars, and you've actually coined the phrase catastrophic nationalism to describe Germany in the age of the two world wars that I think we'll be able to get to. And so it's interesting, these comments of reassessing critically the legacy of Andreas Hilgruber I think lead right into the next set of questions. And I'd like to, before getting into those, Michael, just offer a quick quote to our audience from your contribution to Shattered Past, the 2003 book that I mentioned at the outset, that whatever else may be said about the Germans and their history, they will be remembered for the ferocity with which they fought two world wars and the depravity that led them to the premeditated attempt at murdering any and all Jews in their sphere of power. The mark of having unleashed wars that challenged the very foundation of civility and the stain of having plotted the murder of every person of Jewish descent will not disappear. As far as the 20th century is concerned, the Germans will be universally remembered for their savagery, whatever else they may have done. So with that quote, Michael, it's quite a powerful statement. I, I would like to look at your work, not in terms of the sequence of publications, but how you, have approached a, a crucial chronology in 20th century German history, which is 1916 to 1945. And so why don't we just start with 1916, about halfway through World War I, and to look at some of the, you know, some of the arguments, some of the claims, the evidence that you produced in two pieces, this article, German Strategy in the Age of Machine Warfare, and a piece you published 15 years later called Insurrectionary Warfare. And so it really deals with the last two years and the end of the First World War for Imperial Germany. And so with that, Michael, the first part of this is how you viewed the third supreme command of Paul von Hindenburg and Erich Ludendorff, who take over the German side of the war, right, in 1916, and you talk about escalatory strategy and why it's really important for us to understand how Germany wages war in the last two years of the First World War that helps us understand this broader period of world war and genocide. Well, let's... Uh focus uh, on 1916 and see what happens. Now, what we know from now what has become a big industry is that all belligerent nations, that is the French, the British, the Austrians, Italians, Russians, all of them 
in 1916-17 essentially moved into a second generation of mobilization. That is, what happened is that now entire societies got involved in the war. Nobody any longer was excluded. Everyone in one way or the other was mobilized. How this was done differed from nation to nation. The question was what role women should play in this new scenario. The question was what role children should play in this scenario. The question was how you divide the labor uh, between soldiers and workers. All this was an open issue. But very clearly what was new and what was uh, was, uh, what was very different from 19th century warfare is that all of society effectively waged war. Now, if I say new, it is of course new in the sense that the preceding period had limited, uh, limited warfare dramatically. And in earlier periods, there were uh, uh, this division between the military and society uh, uh, did not uh, did not exist quite in in the same way. There's a good argument to be made that the French Revolutionary War and the Napoleonic War were in the same sense total wars. Now returning to uh, to the German situation, what distinguished the German situation is that in this situation, rather than civilian leaders taking the helm and mobilizing the nation, it was military demands emanating from the, effectively the field commanders, uh, the, the supreme, that is the supreme command, the Oberste Heeresleitung, uh, Oberste Heeresleitung. they attempted to set the, the goals for mobilization. They attempted to rally the entire nation behind the program of kind of resource exploitation that cut very deep into, uh, into German society, the mobilization of people, uh, both uh, of, of, of men and women, and the mobilization of forced labor in occupied territories. So this, uh, uh, this mobilization uh, uh, effectively continued the war for another two years, but it all was entirely predicated on winning the war and pushing the costs on the defeated nations. So this kind of situation where you fight in order to win or you go down because you've exploited your resources so much that your, uh, your finances, et cetera, that you have to completely rebuild your nation. That's the new, that's the new situation of 1916. Add to that in 1917, uh, the entry of the United States and the Russian Revolution uh, uh, on the other side, on the, on the Eurasian side of, of, of geopolitics. And you have a situation in which German mobilization, ever deeper mobilization, would run up against a global mobilization of resources and at the same time, the revolutionary upheaval that threatened to overthrow uh, uh, order, uh, the, the, the imperial order, not just in Germany, but everywhere. So you enter an, an entirely new scene in which global resources suddenly play a role and in which effectively ideological counter war plays a tremendous uh, 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 that is uh, uh, a revolu uh, ideological, uh, ideologically motivated revolution play an immense role. 
in this situation, uh, you have a nationalist mobilization in Germany uh, that has distinctly proto-fascist elements, but effectively aims, is very unclear where it's aiming. It clearly, however, says that in order to, uh, in order to fight war, uh, to be able to fight war at all, you have to have a strong leader who will rest, not just rescue Germany, but will German make uh, all of Germany to fight. And that would include, uh, exclude, eliminate, even exterminate all kinds of internal enemies in order to guarantee the homogen uh, homogeneity of the nation, which uh, is a, which was considered, which became the prerequisite for a unified society fighting war. Well, Michael, you've already pointed to a number of kind of precursors to the 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 Nazi way of waging war, which we're going to get to uh, soon. But I wanted to follow this up then about the the kind of Hindenburg Ludendorff approach of mobilizing the entire society with this 2001 article you published in the Journal of Modern History, Insurrectionary Warfare. And there you talk it, about this debate, this astonishing debate, Michael, in October 1918 yeah. at the highest levels and, and some very surprising people, not just in the German military, not like just established right wing circles who get involved in a an extreme proposal to save Germany or or not. And could you tell us about that and how that also helps us understand something about the 1939 to 45 period? Yes, it is paradoxical. Uh, and uh, it is par uh, it is paradox. The situation in 1918 is so paradoxical because on the one hand, Ludendorff, who was kind of mobilizing and mobilizing and threatening and threatening and wanting to get more and more out of, the, uh, out of society, faced with the collapse of the German offensive in, 19, uh, in spring, summer 1918 and the counterattack, the extremely successful counterattack, first of the French and then of the British, which eventually rolled back the German front and by, uh, uh, by uh, September, October, actually breached the Hindenburg line and pushed Germans back, uh, uh, the German forces back in deep into Belgium and uh, to the edges of France. Hindenburg, in, uh, Ludendorff in that situation uh, uh, effectively was completely paralyzed. I think uh, there is an argument that he had a nervous breakdown and I think the, 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 that is absolutely correct what happened. And he's not the only one. Kaiser Wilhelm at that point was often found lying in bed for days on end. Uh, it is, <laughs> is that, uh, but in that situation, it's a peculiar combination of politicians. Uh, the uh, industrialist Rathenau being among them, then Protestant churches being very active in them, uh, uh, po uh, politi political advisors coming often from Württemberg, effectively all of them civilians are saying, look, this is a situation in which war can only end in a last effort, an endkampf, a final, a final uh, battle in which we are either defeated, uh, uh, in, in which we either win and, uh, and uh, the, the, the allied advance comes to a standstill or we are defeated. Uh, and uh, this is not necessarily annihilated, but they wanted to have, wanted it to come to uh, to uh, to have uh, this uh, 
last honorable battle, like you had a first battle. Uh, and effectively what happened in that situation, well, what is interesting about this is first, these are mostly national liberal Germans. This, are, this is not the military that argues for self-destruction. These are national liberal Germans, national liberal Germans that had let, uh, have read a little too much Clausewitz, have read a little too much about the wars of liberation. They had read a little too much Heinrich von Kleist and uh, caught the spirit, as it were, uh, a spirit that was dramatically nixed by effectively the groundswell of German popular sentiment that said no more war. And the fear of that that groundswell would lead to, uh, uh, would lead to a Bolshevik revolution uh, among the elites who at the same time thought it was necessary to, and that is a very Prussian German idea, it's Hegel, uh, you know, uh, uh, that you need to preserve the state in order to preserve German's position, Germany's position in the international system and to essentially rescue the military and the monopoly of violence uh, that comes with it. It is for that reason that the military actually contrasts that with how what happens then after 1939, in which the military leader at that point, it was no longer Ludendorff, but General Gröner. And in the context of, uh, uh, of, 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 uh, of uh, after a meeting with uh, the, the field commanders, decided Wilhelm II had to go uh, if, a peace, uh, if a peace and the preservation of the German state could be rescued. The state as an entity, as an institution and the monopoly of violence were more important than their symbolic representative, and that is the Kaiser. This is how the uh, this is how imperial uh, German the German Empire effectively uh, effectively ended, and monarchy has not returned. Uh, that's but compare this to then uh, let's move down to 1944-45. There was, of course, the uh, uh, there was, of course, uh, Stauffenberg and his co-conspirators who wanted to overthrow the Third Reich. But that was a tiny minority in a sea of generals and colonels who were absolutely ready to fight, although they knew very clearly that there was absolutely no, uh, no chance of success. That is that they were destroying themselves and destroying their nation. But that in turn, you know, this gets back to the big uh, theme. Uh, there are many reasons. Of course, there are the me there's the memory of World War I that is one of them. But the other very important reason is that they knew that they had fought a dishonorable war. Whatever they said after, uh, after defeat, when they wrote the histories. So the myth of the clean Wehrmacht is of course one kind of myth, but you have to understand that they knew that they were implicated in a regime and in a war that was dishonorable and shameful. That's well, the difference. That, but, yeah. I, I'm just going to say that that's so interesting and rich and makes me want to follow that up with uh, kind of connecting the dots between this in -comp, this kind of final battle conception that that article really shows that reached fever pitch and 
October 1918 before the revolution swept away the monarchy. And then the, the late World War II, the Nazi regime desperately fighting this genocidal war. You published a book in 1980, Michael, it's never been translated, unfortunately, into English called Auf Rüstung oder Sicherheit, Armaments or Security. And this is a question here put forward by my boss, Rob Satino, well known to our audience, the Institute's executive director and senior historian here at the museum. He has always been fascinated by this argument that you advanced there about the or, the arms or security. And why didn't arms bring security to Germany? In this, this period you cover is 1924 to 36 in this book. Why did that not happen for Germany? Why didn't arms bring security? Well, uh, first of all, I would have to congratulate your boss that he actually read the German correctly, in the sense because most people, actually many, uh, many people I encountered read it as armaments and security. Right? That seemed to be the sensible. Uh, that seemed to be the sensible way to go. But consider this. Well, first of all, conceptually and theoretically, back then I was an arms controller. I came from the school, uh, from that entire school uh, that emerged uh, in the context uh, of, of the 1960s nuclear pact and the kind of reduction of the nuclear threat in Europe. I actually, one of my first reviews I ever wrote was a long review on exactly that issue. Uh, but empirically, it simply reflects a reality I had to grapple with when looking at the Reichswehr, uh, that, is the, uh, that is the army, the armed forces of the Weimar Republic. Now, the so Reichswehr had made, made wonderful plans by 1924 uh, for a 90 division army with which it would be a world power again. And lo and behold, in 1939, it actually achieved something like that. But in 1924, it had uh, 1923, 24, it had to realize that effectively it was incapable of defense if the French advanced as they did advance into the Ruhr or even in, the, in defense against a Polish incursion of one kind or another was very clear, they were, Germany, despite that 100,000 men army was effectively defenseless, militarily defenseless against the, uh, its, uh, its neighbors. Now, after 1924, after the Dawes plan, after the stabilization of the economy, was Germany actually uh, threatened? Was Germany more insecure for the fact that it could not defend itself militarily? Not at all. G Germany was happily developing as, a, as an economic power, was for a few years happily developing as the kind of roaring 1920s Weimar Germany, which you know, and which, you, which all of us love. But clearly, it was, not, it was not threatened and it was secure, secure enough as the State Department argued to pursue an alternative politics of revision, which had a curious future. The idea was effectively to become the economic magnet for Central Europe and indeed for Western Europe and Southern Europe and Scandinavia and by the very force of its economic power, 
also move towards territorial revision. Those were not uh, uh, those were not plans for an EU or an economic community. Those were cl clearly plans also for border revisions. But the point was, economic power would replace military power. Now, this is the, this is simply the empirical layout of the land this is what pe what people argued in this case it was a uh, famous foreign minister stresemann argued the discourse and more so his successor courtius so you have this uh, as a real option further in comes arms control armaments is not simply controlled armaments but uncontrolled armaments, which became, became the reality in 19, uh, 1933-34. I thought when I wrote that damn book that is so fat that it should not be translated, it's way too thick. Uh, but I thought what was interesting uh, uh, was that German, of course, Germans or German, the German military developed a more realistic program of free armament, which would have given it a kind of minimal force of a 21 division, 300,000 men army, uh, 100,000 professional soldiers, 200,000 reserves by 1952. So my argument was, and I'm, I, I was a convinced and still to a point am a convinced arms controller. What if the Western allies, what if the English and the French had said, well, this we can actually do, you know, 20 years are a long history. Should we let the Germans do it? Should we control German armaments in, in an international uh, in an, uh, in an international agreement in an arm uh, in uh, in the context of the disarmament conference, well, suddenly, of course, this is a different world, but suddenly we are back in the situation with Iran. Should we control nuclear armaments and extend, you know, the stretch? 10 years, 12 years until there is the chance for a bomb, hoping and working that we can actually change the opinion climate in Germany, stabilize the country, or for that matter, Iran, or should we say no? Now, if we say no, of course we have to risk the possibility and this is exactly what happened we have to risk the possibility that germans would speed up their argument uh, their armaments which they were perfectly ready and the military wanted it of course but you know it's in the limits of what's possible it happened and the nazis came to power in 1933 and then the ball was in the court of the allies and particularly of France, should they intervene? And they did not. And the last moment they could have intervened and would have succeeded was not 1938, that was way too late, but 1936 when Germany occupied the demilitarized zone because this prevented France from moving without fighting across the Rhine. And with that, the threat of effectively stopping any German move, the, 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 the real threat and the real ability to do so without, much, without fighting had ended. So by 1936, the arms control scheme had dissolved into thin air to put what was a potential in the 1920s had become then a runaway arm uh, a, a, a runaway armament a runaway armament in which everyone began to rearm rapidly 
and in which set in motion the escalation uh, that was kind of cut like a Gordian knot by Hitler in 1938 when he decided he wanted war and he wanted war now and this is the only time he could have, could have war if he waited until the generals are ready like General Beck who was crucial at this point if he waited until the generals were ready Germany would never be able to fight. So that that's that's that story. That is, and, that, you've given us a lot there, Michael, to consider, especially these notions of thresholds when when it became too late, really, to intervene without there being a great deal of fighting. I'm looking at our time here, Michael. It's 11:45 or so. Oh my God! And uh, yeah, such a, a great conversation. But I think we probably should let others uh, see if they want to join us and see what questions are out there. Uh, there's one I think that kind of presents itself already, um, which is just because of our date. Today's December 9th and we're two days away from the anniversary of Hitler's decision to declare war on the United States. And you mentioned that at the outset, Michael, about the role of the United States in kind of the German, in German military strategic thinking going back to the end of World War I. Um, there's a lot of debate about why Hitler decides to do it then. What, what's your take on this? Why Hitler decides four days after Pearl Harbor to go to war with the U.S.? Well, I'm looking here to find uh, the damn quote, which now I do not find. But, you know, that is a very strange decision, right? And in fact, Hitler himself thought it was a strange decision. Strange because he thought that it is odd, and this is, uh, this is now a paraphrase, that he supported the Japanese in order to destroy, and this is a quote, the white race in Asia, whereas the British, fought with the, and this is again a quote, because this is what I really remember, that he fought, that the British fought with the Bolshevik pigs in order to, uh, in order to defeat Germany. So, so it is a very peculiar situation, but what is it uh, that actually motivated this, uh, that decision? There is a long history uh, behind it. And the first part of it is that Hitler was always clear that the European war, and that is first the revisionist little European war, but even the war against the Soviet Union would, if victorious, would only create the space for what really mattered. And that is to become no longer a world power, but distinctly a global power, a global power that could match the resources and the potentials of the United States. So this is again one of actually one of Hillgruber's insights, which is has recently been uh, 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 ca come up in the Eng in an English book by, uh, by Professor Sims from Cambridge. So that's the one thing. The second thing is that um, Germany in order to, uh, was never able to launch actually a coordinated plan of attack across the, uh, in, uh, across the Eurasian sphere. Uh, what happened is that the Germans fought their war in Russia alone without Japanese help and the Japanese attacked uh, the United States uh, long in, in a context in which Hitler was not yet ready actually to, su to support them. So he entered that war as it were, as a junior partner, as a, a, as a, minor, uh, uh, as a minor force hoping and expecting 
that by 1942-43, uh, the, uh, the Soviet Union would be finally defeated and he could pull the resources out of the Soviet Union in order to face fully the United States in the West. So the declaration of war was a kind of uh, was a kind of follow-up move on the Japanese attack that would bear fruit only if something happened that did not happen, and that is the Soviet Union would be defeated, if not in 1941, then in 1942. Uh, so there, there are lots of, uh, there were, uh, there, it's a very complicated diplomatic game in 1941. Uh, the, a game, again, which is not least influenced by American actions, uh, which very clearly made sure that it would not fight, the United States would not fight in isolation, but could fight or could prevail at this point, it wasn't fighting yet in, in the summer 1941, could only prevail if it moved into an international, into an international and interstate context. That included first and foremost an alliance with Great Britain that included the moving the defense peri perimeter deep into the Atlantic, the occupation of Iceland that uh, was uh, the, in that uh, also decisive, the Caribbean and Venezuela. Uh, the United States were effectively moving themselves into a position to fight one way or the other, either first in support or then as active participant. And what they didn't have to do is actually declare the war on Nazi Germany because they did it themselves. But summer 1941 is really, uh, for a diplomatic historian, it's the most, most fascinating moment. It's the kind of pivot of World War, uh, of World War, uh, of World War II. Not least, because the Germans assumed that the Soviet Union would be defeated, but the Americans and the British also presumed that this might happen and the Japanese thought so too. So, and the one power that actually fought its way out of this conundrum on its own and then subsequently with a lot of American help uh, that came in incidentally through Stalingrad, right? Through the Iran-Stalingrad axis. Uh, that's why Stalingrad in 1942 is not just this monumental defense, but it is a strategic defense uh, of the supply lines. Uh, 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 yeah. Well, Michael, I'm looking at our, our time and uh, this is such a, an interesting discussion. I think we had all wanted to just keep going, but I think we have time at least for one more. And you've already pointed us to 1941-42. And one of the things that comes up in a number of your, your articles is returning to this notion of mobilizing society that we saw with the Hindenburg-Ludendorff period. Then the Nazi case trying to mobilize German society around a vision of a master race ideology yeah. that you see by this point, this Nazi way of waging war. How successful do you think the Hitler dictatorship was in winning Germans and Austrians, for that matter, over to this vision of the war as a racial struggle for supremacy? That's a very difficult question, uh, but I think you have to keep at least two things in mind. First and foremost, uh, the Nazis were able to create a very distinct vanguard of ideological fighters. This was not a small group. 
This was the SS, this was the Gestapo, this was the entire apparatus, the National Socialist apparatus. Much of it was corrupt, but some of it was also very efficient. So this is where Hannah Arendt went wrong when she took on Eichmann and thought he was kind of a, a, a was kind of a you know a, a convert who was kind of sailing along. No, the argument is more complicated. But the point is, without that vanguard of really committed ideological fighters that were indoctrinated, they believed it, and they were self-motivating. They did not need commands. They acted on their own. They killed on their own. They murdered on their own, right? They had the protection from above. They had the ideological umbrella, all that. But they deeply believed without that apparatus and without that personnel, and that's more than 100,000 men. That is a lot of people. The Nazis would not have been successful. On the other hand, you know, there is an argument about German bystanders. And honorable as that argument is, I just don't believe it. Not because the Germans were all of the Germans were ideal, ideologized uh, and were kind of committed Nazis. That's not the way it happened. Although the kind of infiltration of racist and anti-Semitic ideas, which were common anyways, but and then the shaping of those ideas was important. But what was more important is that the Nazis were capable of systematically closing down the gap between activist and pure bystander. You could not but be part of the regime, whether you were fighting in Russia a vicious war or whether you were working at home in the middle of forced laborers, which were starved to death. Think of it in simple terms. The Germans lived reasonably well despite bombing and everything because of the famine and hunger everywhere else. So we, of course, would like to think of, you know, the extermination camps like Auschwitz as the calamity and as the dishonor and as the shame. But it's the everyday routines. Germans lived the way they lived and they lived relatively well because others did the hard labor, others suffered, others paid the price, others were hungry, others starved to death. That is the implication. There was no room for a bystander in this. You could be a nice person. You could even be uh, like my mother, uh, moderately protesting Catholic in, 90, in the 1930s and in the 1940s, retaining her faith, never kind of entering the National Socialist camp, never kind of being ideologized. And yet, Obviously, she was part of that system. There was absolutely no way out. And she knew it. She was a simple person, but very clearly that she knew. Well, Michael, you've definitely been one of the scholars who forced a real confrontation with the fact that World War II on the German side was a war it became certainly a war of extermination continent-wide and a war of subjugation. And that your work in that sense has done, you know, an enormous good, I think, in forcing people to not sidestep, minimize that aspect of the war. So, Michael, I want to thank you for joining us today for an excellent discussion about these topics, the German military, the Third Reich, and the, the connection between the two world wars.
this has really given us so much to mull over. And I would like to thank all our viewers for joining us today and want to encourage you to join our webinar this evening at 6 p.m. with on Dory Miller. That's going to be a real treat as well. And hope you will come back for future outings here at the National World War II Museum. And with that, I want to say goodbye for now and hope to see you again next year. Thanks very much.